Hello, and welcome to our training on Privacy and Pandemics Video Classrooms. My name is Amelia Vance, and I'm the Director of Education and Youth Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. Today, we're going to be talking specifically about an issue that's risen up during the coronavirus pandemic. How exactly videoed classes interact with the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and what are some best practices to protect your privacy and the privacy of your students? So a common question that we've gotten is whether FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, allows video conferencing. Obviously, as a law passed in 1974, we don't have a lot of insight here, but we do have a little bit. So you can generally assume that when you're teaching online, you can use a video conferencing tool so long as it meets the school official exception to FERPA's consent requirement. The school official exception, as you'll remember from earlier in the training, allows schools to use tools for online learning so long as the company that you're working with is performing an institutional service or function that the school, if it had unlimited money and resources, would otherwise use its own employees for. The company has to have a legitimate educational interest in that information. The company has to be under the school's direct control regarding its use of education information. We discussed what that means in one of our earlier ed tech trainings. And the company can only use education records and personal information for authorized purposes, and they can't redisclose it. Oftentimes, tools developed for general audiences or workplace were not likely designed with student privacy laws in mind. Your first step in looking to use a video conferencing platform or other video software should be to check if your school has a preferred or pre-vetted tool or a contract in place with the tool you'd like to use. Many tools for consumer audiences or office audiences may also have a version of their product that has certain privacy protections enabled. You still have to make sure that you're signing up for the right version of the product though, or you could accidentally violate FERPA or other state laws. Another big question that we've gotten is whether the presence of others such as a parent in the background of a class is a violation of student privacy rights. It is likely not. This usually is, this is an issue that FERPA is fairly silent on. Uh, parents are technically allowed, so long as district policy allows it, to sit, for example, in the back of a class. And that is not considered a violation of student privacy rights. But still, be aware that students are at home and that student personal information that you may be sharing if you're having a particularly, you know, emotional discussion after reading a book in English class or uh, having an impassioned discussion about, you know, civil rights as part of a social studies course. Be aware that, you know, students sharing personal information may be overheard by more than those in the class. And so be careful and remind them that they themselves should be careful as well of sharing personal information that they don't want others to know during class sessions. Have students agree to and sign some sort of agreement that talks about their behavior during video lessons. So agreements that they will not, for example, screenshot pictures of the class and, you know, potentially embarrass other students by posting them on social media, or worse, post a picture of a student that, you know, may, for all they know, uh, be in a domestic violence situation, and that could bring physical harm to them. Make students aware of potential privacy and security consequences for bad behavior, such as 
encouraging Zoom bombers by sharing the link to a video class, using inappropriate language in chat, or other issues that may come up in the online learning environment. The more you can set expectations up front, the better. So what about recordings? We've gotten a lot of questions about this. You certainly are not required by any privacy-related law to actually record sessions, but you very likely may want to proactively record class sessions since so many students uh, may be less accessible now, may not have access to a device when you're holding a live course. Um, all of those things that may make it valuable to record the class session. So consider whether the reason to record is worth the privacy risks. In many times, it will be. So some potential privacy risks. If students are on screen and in the recording, the recording could be a window into their personal lives as they learn from home. You can mitigate this risk by having students perhaps turn off their video when they're not speaking or other things like that. If you record, then personal information shared during the lesson, which is protected by FERPA, would now be stored, be potentially replicable, and redisclosure of the recording could be difficult to rein in. How can you limit that? Also, videos may capture students chatting amongst themselves or with you and may share sensitive information in that chat. Are you storing that chat log or capturing it as part of a video recording? So there's some best practices and questions to ask your school about all of this. So ask your school about policies about video recording even prior to this. Were there students who perhaps had to attend school remotely because of an immunocompromising illness? If so, what were the recording policies in those cases? How long were recordings stored? If there aren't existing policies, ask that they be created so you have clarity. Where will recordings be saved? Is there a process for deleting it? No matter what, make sure that you are furthering transparency and trust. Be transparent and let students know that they're being recorded when they are, how long the recording will be stored, who has access to the recording, and think about allowing students to opt out of attending a live recording, or as I mentioned, to turn their video off or share information that is less personal or less personally identifiable. When you are recording, consider recording only the presentation portion of what you're doing, so the lecture portion of your lesson. As much as possible, ensure that the recording only records the lecturer or host, so you, and not student videos, names, or chat log. And when possible, avoid recording classroom discussions with students since that's when personal information may come up. And finally, remind students and parents that recordings or any screenshots from recordings are not to be shared and consider having them sign an agreement that they will keep the videos confidential. There are several best practices here. So the Consortium of School Networking and the Department of Education, as well as my organization, have put out guidance and done webinars on some of these issues. Think about using administrative controls to protect your video classroom to prevent Zoom bombers. Don't require students to have their cameras on throughout the lesson. Consider your students' circumstances. Some may have limited internet access. Some may not have access to a private room for learning. Having them have their video on could be pretty harmful. And that harm may outweigh any benefit from them having their video on. If you're worried about students paying attention, perhaps considering some sort of short quiz at the end of lessons that can show who was paying attention and who perhaps wasn't. Consider developing rules of engagement for your students. 
and also, of course, develop alternative options for students with limited access to devices or to internet. Thank you so much for attending this training.